As always, it's a pleasure to be before you once again. If you would, be turning to the 17th book of Acts, or 17th chapter of the book of Acts. We'll spend a few moments here to get our theme. Acts chapter 17. We'll be reading the the verses 5 through 9, but first, a little bit of an introduction regarding these verses. We see here in chapter 17 that Paul and Silas are journeying into Thessalonica. By this point, they have arrived at their destination. We see from verses 1 and 2 of this chapter that Paul has a habit of seeking out their synagogues and teaching in them. It says, as his manner was. Verses 2 and 3, we see that he spent three Sabbath days there teaching them. Verse 4 shows us that because of this preaching, some of them believed. But then when we get to our text, again, verses 5 through 9, we see that they are met with resistance by the Jews. So in Acts chapter 17, verse, beginning there in verse 5, it says, But the Jews which believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city on an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. And they, when they had found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren under the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also, whom Jason hath received. And these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying, There is another king, one Jesus. And they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. And when they had taken security of Jason and of the other, they let them go. So they were seeking Paul and Silas, accusing them of turning the world upside down. Again, verse 6. Now, before we go much further into this morning's lesson, I would like to read a, a quote from a historian and author, Tom Holland. He's also an atheist. And I find it quite interesting. While studying the ancient world, Holland writes, he realized something. Simply, the ancients were cruel, and their values utterly foreign to him. The Spartans routinely murdered what they would consider imperfect children. The bodies of slaves were treated like outlets for physical pleasure of those with power. Infanticide was common. The poor and the weak had no rights. How did we get from there to here? It was Christianity, Holland writes. Christianity revolutionized sex and marriage, demanding that men control themselves and prohibiting all forms of rape. Christianity confined sexuality within monogamy. It is ironic, Colin writes, that these are now the very standards for which Christianity is derided. Christianity elevated, elevated women. In short, Christianity utterly transformed the world. You have the Jews of the first century accusing the early Christians of turning the world upside down, but in a negative sense. Yet here we have an atheist recognizing this as a positive thing. So we would like to consider turning the world upside down. After all, our brethren of the first century were accused of doing that very thing. First, we must note that the world lies in spiritual darkness. The world is already lost in sin. Jesus came to save the world, John chapter 3, verse 16. There it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, 
that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Typically, when people quote this verse, they forget about the verses following. Verse 17, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light. Because of their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light. Neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. So we see that Jesus did not come to condemn the world in verse 17. It was already condemned. Verse 18. Only those who obey his will will be saved. Verse 21. Unfortunately, the world at large will be lost. Matthew chapter 7 verse 14 and Luke chapter 13 verse 24. We see that those of the world are slaves to sin. Romans chapter 6 verses 15 through 23. We see in the first 14 verses, verses of that chapter where Paul shows us that we should have died to sin upon our conversion. And if we're living Christian lives, this is exactly what has happened. Through baptism, we die to our old sinful lifestyle. We die to the deeds therein. Once we rise from the water, we're expected to walk a new life. Now we often use this passage to contrast the two lifestyles, and rightly so. We point to a better way of living, and that is God's way. In so doing, we bear fruit for God. But have we considered the other side of this passage? Those who are in sin are slaves to sin. They religiously pursue their physical pleasures and the fulfilling of them. To them, that is the best way of life. As we see in verse 21, <clears throat> they are not ashamed of their deeds. Now, Romans chapter 6, beginning in verse 15, we have the question, What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey? His servants are ye to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness, and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit ye had ye then in those things whereof ye now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's easy for us as Christians to understand that we gave up that old life of sin. Because if we are indeed Christians, that's exactly what happened. We have been converted by the gospel. And we have been saved to serve God, our creator. But you think of the world at large. They don't process things like that. They're here for the day. They're here for the physical. They have a right that seems way unto them. But as we've just read and are now referencing, the, the end thereof is death. Proverbs chapter 14 verse 12. Proverbs 16 verse 25. Their way only leads to spiritual death. And in some cases, physical death as well. 
With these, with, with these things in mind, what then should we expect from the world? Well, to use our, our quote earlier from Tom Holland, and this should hit home well with us, pun intended, because the home has been under attack for quite some time. So let's think about a logical course for the home. If one does not have proper respect or even no respect for God, it follows that that individual will have little or no respect for marriage as God has defined. It would then follow that those engaged in marriage would commit adultery, fornication. Ultimately, that relationship ending in divorce. Now, often children are involved in these marriages. So you would have broken homes. Children with mental distortion. After all, children need stability. They need security. And children need instruction from both parents. Carry it a little bit further. New relationships formed from divorced spouses. These often bring fornication, which typically leads to children born out of wedlock. These children are often referred to as unwanted, unplanned. Well, what many would con consider remedies are abortion, neglect, and abuse. Now this fornication, this adultery, can and will and has quite often brought about STDs, different diseases brought about by these sinful acts. So naturally, we've got to promote the use of contraceptives and sexual education in our school systems to arm our children against what they would say not to do, but still prom promoting the sin itself. The desire to, fill, to fulfill the lust leads ultimately to perverted forms of life. Fornication and adultery is a perversion, just as homosexuality in both forms and our new transgender movement. All these are different perversions of God's pattern. Now, as we consider the world around us, the world seeks to remedy the symptoms and not the cause. You have a child you don't want? Rip them out. Kill them. After all, it's just a blob of cells. I thank God that Texas is able to pass this legislation. And it's interesting and despicable that our current leaders, particularly in Washington, are trying to undermine that. We don't need children. After all, they're not our future, right? You should be able to fulfill the desires of your flesh and not have any consequences. You can't have unborn babies holding you back from whatever your dreams are. Forget the fact that you're engaged in sin by reproducing. The fornication, that is. That child is an innocent bystander. And now we're punishing that unborn baby for our un un unrighteousness. Rather than seeking God, we seek to destroy those who would be in our way. And unfortunately, that child is in their way. We see that the world is militant against all who would oppose them. 1 John chapter 3, verses 12 and, 4, 12 and 13. Is it any wonder then... While we have so many different warnings about persecution. In Acts chapter 13 verse 50, we see that the Jews were stirred up and they raised perse persecution against Paul and Barnabas. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 12, persecution is a promise for all who would live godly. They shall suffer persecution. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 2, there we see a prayer of deliverance from wicked and unreasonable men. We see from Jesus in preparing his apostles for his absence. 
John chapter 15, verses 18 through 21. He there says, If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you. The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. But all things they will do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. Well, what did they do to Jesus? They murdered him. Can we expect any different when we stand up for the truth? Should we expect any different when we stand up for the truth? In sending out his twelve apostles, in Matthew chapter 10, verses 16 through 18, he there gives them this warning. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents, and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues. And ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. Do you think the world has changed any? Sure, we might have a generation where there's some form of peace in the church. Where we might have one particular spot in doctrine that nobody is fighting against. But in other areas, now we're lacking. You see, at large, the world is always out to get the light. It hates the light. Jesus knew this. Jesus attempted to prepare his apostles for this reality. And we who would attempt to wear the name of Christian should be aware of this. The world hates us. Secondly, what is the Christian's obligation to the world? keeping these different things in mind. Well, we must have the proper love for the world. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, we're told not to love the world, neither the things that are in the world. But you see, one thing we must note, there are two different kinds of love mentioned in verse 15. Love not the world and love the world. Those two phrases implore or employ the word agapeo, which points to a, a love in a social or moral sense, a beloved love. But then you see the love of the Father. That phrase employs agape, which is the highest form of love, affection, benevolence, charity. So you see, the world ought not to be our preferred dwelling place. It ought not be preferred over God and His children. As Christian pilgrims, we ought not fall in love with the campgrounds. Instead, we must be about our Father's business, and that is soul saving. Jude, verse 17 through 23. He there pins, But beloved... Remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time, who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the Spirit, but ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost and keeping yourselves in the love of God looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And of some, have compassion, making a difference. And others, save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. You see, as Christians, we should not love the things that are of the world, that are in the world, the lusts thereof. But we should use our very being to pull those from the fire. That in fact at this very hour, enjoy the lusts of the world, who are enslaved to it. Then we must have the proper attitude in our work. 
we must not focus solely on winning an argument and condemning the lost, but realize the soul to whom we speak is already lost. You see, the Word of God will convict them. The Word of God is going to show them that they're lost. We are simply the messenger. This is God's Word. You must follow it if you are to be saved, if you are in, in to enjoy heaven once this life is over. We must also have the mentality of Jesus our Savior. Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 38. It says, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as, have, or as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. You see, the world is lost, and they have no idea that they are lost. They have no idea what that means. You ask someone if they're lost, no, I, I made it here, I'm, I'm where I'm supposed to be. They're wedded to the flesh. They oftentimes behave as one without a leader. You think of the little ducklings. You have the mom leave them. They have no idea what to do. They start wandering around looking for mama duck. Well, the world is very similar to that. When there's no mama duck, they're going to do whatever they think is right. As we've referenced earlier, what they think is right always leads to death and destruction. We must... Speak the truth in love, that is agape. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 15. That is seeking one's highest good. Salvation is the highest good for mankind. This then deals with the how we are to teach. Our approach must change based on our audience. Titus chapter 1 verses 9 through 13. Some need sharper words to understand the point given. Some might need softer words. This does not mean altering the truth. This does not mean compromising the truth. You preach the truth, but how you say certain things might make a bigger, a bigger impact as opposed to other ways. The same truth can be taught, but with different approaches. We must have the same boldness and the same attitude of Stephen as in Acts chapter 7, verses 54 through 60. It's recorded there that when they heard these things, his audience, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven, and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing on the right hand of God, and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears, and ran upon him with one accord, and cast him out of the city, and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God, and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down, and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. He boldly proclaimed the gospel of Christ to these people. And the people stoned him for it. I've been hit with a lot of different things throughout my life, but I've never actually been tried to be stoned to death. Don't you think this man was in agony? Don't you think maybe we in his position might have cried for vengeance? Maybe he fought back to some extent? He prayed to God, lay not this sin to their charge.
Do we have the same mentality towards the lost? After all, when you have a wounded animal and you try messing with it, whether it's poking it with a stick or trying to injure it more, that animal is going to fight harder to defend itself. That's about where the world is, spiritually speaking. When we start exposing their deeds, trying to make them ashamed of their wickedness, they fight harder. We must also keep in mind that all that we, we do should be done with authority from God's word. Colossians chapter 3 verse 17. And hardly as unto the Lord. Colossians 3 chapter, or chapter 3 verse 23. Think about it as we are working for Jesus. As if he's right there beside us and everything that we do is actually to him. He's not there physically. But he is there. How are we working? Are we working? And third, how must Christians discharge their obligations to the world? How must we do this? We must realize that we are engaged in a spiritual battle. We are a part of a spiritual kingdom. As such, there is no physical fighting. John chapter 18, verse 36. Jesus there reasoning with Pilate, if my kingdom was physical, my followers would fight. Kingdom's not, not physical. We must also realize that our enemy is Satan. We might get too concerned about what's going on in other countries and who they're going to bomb and who we're going to bomb. No matter what's going on in the news, our enemy is always, first and foremost, Satan. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. This is a spiritual warfare. We're told in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18, to, to war a good warfare. Well, if we're going to fight a battle, we need armor. We need weapons. God has already provided for this need. Romans chapter 13, verse 12. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 17. And 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. Where, pen, or where Paul pins, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You see, God has supplied for our need, even on how we are to conduct ourselves in this great battle. So we must build our own selves up. We must be individually fit for the Master's use in this spiritual war. But then we must seek out those who are faithful and work with them. We would typically refer to this as fellowship. Acts chapter 2 verse 42. They sought out the apostles. They learned the gospel. And they continued in their doctrine. In their fellowship. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 14. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 9. And 1 John chapter 1 verse 7. All of these speaking about fellowship. That must exist between Christians. And ultimately God. Part of this working with faithful members of the church. Is supporting the local work. Is there some sort of door knocking program we can be a part of? Is there a radio program? Going a little beyond that. Is there a worship service that we can attend? You look around and most of the time. These different things are, as we might say, put on the back burner. We can think of all these different excuses as to why I can't be there, but we can't use the reason we need to be there as the excuse to miss out on these sporting events, working in the garden or whatever you want to use in place of those things. Whatever is higher than working with the church is our idol. And it might mean that Maybe I don't work so hard on Saturday so I can actually wake up on time to go to worship on Sunday morning. 
What are our priorities throughout the week? As individual members of the church, are we good examples? 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 10 through 12. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. These things command and teach. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers, in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Obviously, the Christian is supposed to be a good example in the world. However, we must also be a good example compared to our brothers and sisters in Christ. If we all strove to give 100% in our Christian walk, where do you think the church would be? 100% effective, 100% successful. 100% in strength, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. My background is football because that's what I played for six years in school. As an offensive lineman, you have our coach. We're going to hit the sled. We don't move that sled until all five linemen are fully participating. And then from there, you can see, based on the direction of that sled, who all is actually trying. Maybe we're starting to go in circles because that right side is weaker. Well, then we might have our coach stand in the middle to provide extra weight, to challenge us, to cause us to grow, to push that sled harder and farther down the road, or at least down the field. The team could not do better until the individual did better. As they say, the, the chain is only as strong as its weakest link. Because no matter what kind of weight you might try to pull that chain, if that one link is made of plastic, it's going to snap and you lose that load. We as Christians are links in this great chain of Christianity. Are we those good examples that Paul needed Timothy to be? As that good example, do we teach and live out the gospel? It's one thing to teach a good thing. It's something much different to live that same good thing. There's a reason there's people being accused of hypocrites because they play a part. They might say a good thing, but their lives don't bear it out. This should never be true of the child of God. Are we there, are we there to help our brethren? Whatever the need might be. Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 5, as well as verse 10. We should be there to supply for physical needs as well as the spiritual needs. All of these things strengthen the individual, and collectively, they strengthen the church. This enables us to be more successful in our not only our personal work to convert the, the lost, but collectively. After all, the mission statement of the church is to teach the gospel to the lost, to the world around us, ultimately converting them to Christ. So as we wrap this lesson up, we must always be mindful of this statement. Instead of praying for easier times, for better times, we ought to pray for stronger Christians and put the work in to make that happen. I think we have a really good idea about that being from Houston, being close to the coast, having to deal with hurricanes. Do you think it's reasonable for us to say storms don't come by here? Harvey was the last one that hit. Think of the, diff the different types of damage that it caused. Were we out there saying, go away, Harvey. Don't come back. No, we're building the infrastructure. We're making things better to support when that storm hits. Because the storm's coming. And in many ways, the storm is already here. You think about the damage that has been done to the home. 
how many different children are facing who knows what because they don't have a stable home with mama and daddy to guide them in the different things that they need to know to protect them from those who would do them harm. We cannot change the world unless we change ourselves for the better and then go about teaching. We don't fight a physical warfare. We fight a battle of the mind. Now we're only able to make ourselves stronger when we study God's word and rightly divide it. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 15. You talk about or you talk with many of the of a denominational mindset. They look at the Bible from cover to cover and think that's God's plan of salvation. Not even realizing Romans chapter 15 verse 4. All of this has a purpose. But it must be taken in the proper context. It must be taken for the purpose that it was given. We are to learn from the Old Testament, but we're saved by the New Testament. You know, we sing a song like that with the children. We learn from the old, we're saved by the new. We've got to be able to defend that principle and show it to others. Then we must strictly obey and implement the principles that we find in that Bible, particularly the New Testament. And then we must put those things, we must exercise ourselves, our senses, through use. As a power lifter, you don't get stronger until you pick up heavier weight. Same is true of bodybuilders, same of any physical sport. If you want to get stronger, you put in the work. If you want to build a, a stronger brain, you put in the time of study. You put in the necessary time to get better. But then that isn't enough. You put those things into plan, into action. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 14. The world is going to give us plenty of different exercises to run through. Are we prepared for them? Every bit of those exercises helps us grow. And then we must be able to teach and to show others to do the same. Matthew chapter 28 verse 20. I would like to, clo cl to close with another quote from a different atheist. Richard Dawkins. He said this back in 2010. There are no Christians, as far as I know, blowing up buildings. I am not aware of any major Christian denomination that believes the penalty for apostasy is death. I have mixed feelings about the decline of Christianity insofar as Christianity might be a bulwark against something worse. Again, that's Richard Dawkins, famous atheist. Now, as he points out, he, he's in having in mind about, quote, Christian denominations. There are denominations, but they are not Christian. However, the Christian principles that are implemented, the thought still carries the same way. If an atheist can realize the good benefit of Christianity in the wicked world, why can't we? Why can't we? But if we can see the benefit, what are we doing about it? As light of the world, as salt of the earth, we must keep ourselves unspotted from the world. Only then can we ourselves be strong, be faithful to God, and be properly qualified and fit to be teaching those around us and to be their good examples. Now, if you're not a Christian, you cannot be that good example. You might do good deeds, but you're not qualified to benefit from the rewards of those things. Matthew chapter, Matthew chapter 7 shows that quite clearly. If you're not a Christian, why not become one today? We talked about what it need, what's necessary to become one, ultimately being baptized into Christ, having your sins washed away. Until that happens, you're just as lost as the rest of the world. However, if you are a Christian, we've, we've also referenced what is necessary for you to be restored if you've allowed sin back into your life, and that is repentance and prayer. Contacting the blood of Christ once more to cleanse you of your, unwi or your unrighteousness. 
So whatever the need might be this morning, please make it known as together we stand and sing.